They relieved the palms of their branches as the people's palms grasped and then brandished those leafy emblems of both festival and rebellion. These were a people who felt as though they had already spent their second, third, and last chances on zealots, men like Barabbas and that now famous Maccabean. But this Jesus, this new champion, was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey as Zechariah had envisioned him. This king was coming to daughter Zion to take the wicked Roman chariots away from Ephraim. Surely this Jesus was the one to bring God's people salvation. Surely he was the one pictured all across the prophet's hopeful panorama. So they shouted, save us please. They cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. And this Jesus would answer yes to their cry of save us, save us. But not in the way they expected. Not by the violent overthrow predicted by their palmy political propaganda. For the humility of that donkey was nothing compared to the way he would answer their shouts of Hosanna. For the path on which he rode took him not to a throne, but to a court. Not to a place fit for a heavenly king, but to the feet of an earthly lord. It was there, before another crowd, in the hands of Pilate, whom God endowed with the power to answer the shouts rising loud, demanding crucifixion for this man who was so recently avowed as Hosanna by those who had laid down a pathway of both palm branch and personal shroud. It was there that he would show how he would answer both crowds both the Hosanna save us cry and the incessant crucify. For what was missed by each tribe, by those who cried out their Hosanna boast and those who cried that this man should be nailed upon two posts, is that Jesus would say no to neither request. Instead, he would say yes to both. In fact, he would accomplish salvation by such infliction. He would be Hosanna by undergoing crucifixion. He would say yes to cries of love and yes to cries of hate. And for us, it is good news that he answered this way. For we too cry Hosanna. We too need to be saved. But we also cry crucify him. We also are filled with hate. We need to be rescued from our evil, but when goodness comes to us, we take what is good and by our evil, hang it on a cross. But this is how he saves us. This is how he loves us. He answered our cry of need and our cry of hate with one final yes poured out as he cried so that the sin that put him on the cross he paid for as he died and the salvation for which we asked by his yes he supplied. So come lay down your branches and come lift up your palms for the king of our salvation said yes to the night of death so that he could raise the light of dawn. I'm showing that it's, oh, there we go, okay. Good morning again. <laughs> Some of you have heard uh, my testimony, my story of how I came to faith in Jesus Christ, but many of you have, have not. So uh, right before I turned 16 years old, uh, I, I, was just in, I was involved in a lot of bad things, living a double life and uh, getting into lots of trouble, but somehow to that point had skirted getting caught. Uh, but then it all came crashing in on me when uh, I was caught shoplifting one day in the summer 
And um, I'll never forget that moment sitting in the back seat of the police car because suddenly my perspective changed. And it's amazing how many people I've told this story to over the years who have had a similar experience <laughs> sitting in the back seat of a police car. <laughs> God put the pieces of the puzzle together because I had picked up bits and pieces of the, the gospel since I was young. Uh, what Jesus had done for me. Some of the Bible stories that led up to the New Testament. But I didn't understand how they all fit together. And I certainly did not think that any of that was for me. Okay, that was for other people, but I didn't need that. I, I kind of, um, as a kid, I kind of thought, well, I, first of all, let's face it, I hated going to church. Uh, church was boring to me. Uh, it was much different back then than it is today. But I thought it was for old people as a kid that um, after you have done everything you want to do in life and you've had your fun and you've kind of used up life and there's really nothing left to do and you're too old to really do anything that's all that much fun anymore anyway, <laughs> then maybe Jesus becomes more entertaining to you and you actually like to read the Bible and go to church. I, that's really how I, how I saw it. Until I viewed life from the back seat of that cage in the police car. And all of a sudden, God opened my eyes and I understood for the first time, Jesus did that for me. Somehow he's the answer to all this and, and I need him. And I cried out to him in, in my heart. It wasn't anything audible, but in those moments, God, save me. And it wasn't God, save me, as in, like, get me out of trouble, because I was kind of glad I was in trouble. I, I, there was a part of me that was relieved, because this could all be over. The, the pressure and the weight of telling lie after lie and trying to... Uh, tell lies to cover up previous lies and not being able to sleep at night because you're trying to unravel all of the, the, the web of tangled lies that you had created earlier that day. I, I was so relieved to be done with that. I knew that that was over with. And I just said, God, you gotta, I know you're the answer. Here's my life. Take it. You just gotta show me what to do now. And that was when everything changed in my life. I would have never thought that I would be a pastor back then. That, that, of course, came years later. But it was in those moments in the backseat of the police car when Jesus opened my eyes and he revealed to me who he really is. That he became my savior. Have you had that eye-opening moment in your life where he became yours? And you cried out to him, out of a sense of need, out of a sense of desperation. That's what's happening in, in our text this morning on Palm Sunday. There are a lot of people asking the question, who is this? Who is this man riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem? Who is this? So we start in Matthew chapter 21. In verse 10, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. Has your heart been stirred yet with the reality of the conclusion you've come to as to who Jesus really is? Who is this? The people are asking. Matthew chapter 20. Now, as they went out of Jericho... A great multitude followed him. Oh boy, if, if only we had time to unpack the sequence of events that let everything in history was coming to a crescendo on this moment, this week, leading up to the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. But it all kicked off with Palm Sunday. So a great multitude followed him because Jesus had reached the climax of his fame. People were talking and they were assembling and they were thronging him would not leave him alone. Behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. 
But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Those titles there indicate that in their time of desperation, these blind men had not just a sense of physical need because of the loss of their eyesight, but a sense of spiritual need in their crying out to Jesus. Because look at how, look at what happens next, verse 32. So Jesus stood still. And I love that image when all of the crowd is thronging him and everyone's trying to get closer. Jesus is always the picture of calm in the midst of the storm. He called to them and he said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and he touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. They didn't follow him because he restored their eyesight. Now I think that was a, a piece of the puzzle. They followed him because they knew who he was. Number one, he's the eye opener. Has he opened your eyes? Do you see Jesus for who he is? I used to, I told you, I used to think Jesus was for old people, and the mentality that I've seen in, in people um, demonstrated in their thinking, the things that they say since then, it's easy for me to pick up on. I'm sensitive to it because that was me. I hear people thinking and saying things like, well, well Jesus is for other people, but he's not for me. Has your heart been stirred? Or do you still think that Jesus is for other people? Jesus is for you. Have your eyes been opened to Jesus' passionate, personal pursuit of you? Now, John chapter 12, it's interesting in the, the gospel narrative across the four books of the gospels, how we pick up different snippets because the, the, the apostles are detailing the accounts of Palm Sunday from four different perspectives. So we pick up different details in the different accounts. So now we're going to pick up in John chapter 12. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there and they came, not on account of Jesus only, See, there's a lot going on. But so that they might also see Lazarus. Well, who's that guy? What, what's up with him? Why would he be drawing a crowd? Whom Jesus raised from the dead. That's why. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, as in they were also planning to put Jesus to death. Because on account of him, on account of Jesus, and on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So the religious leaders, were, they were losing business. Well, second we see here on Palm Sunday, the, in the person of Palm Sunday, we have our life giver. Jesus reveals himself as our life giver. The religious leaders couldn't argue with that. They could not argue with what happened to Lazarus. They certainly couldn't explain it. The only thing left to do was to kill these guys. We've got to get rid of them. There's too much at stake. Our livelihood is on the line. They stood a lot to lose with everyone leaving their religious system. So in case you're not familiar with what happened to Lazarus, Jesus had gone into the tomb of his friend Lazarus and brought him back to life after he had been dead for four days. The Bible attests to the smell of his rotting flesh after those four days. He raises Lazarus back to life to show that he has the power not only over the, the physical visible, but the spiritual invisible. That he has power over physical death, but also spiritual death and life, and therefore the power to give eternal life. And so people's eyes were opened, and they began to follow the life giver. And John uh, attest to Jesus' words in verse 10 where he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Have you experienced new life in Christ? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, my old life, it has passed away. Behold, have your eyes open. All things have become new. He gives new life. 
Jesus is the life giver. Have you received his gift of eternal life? Well, number three, he's the prophecy fulfiller. This is Jesus' final week upon the earth. There's a sense of expectancy that something big is about to happen. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 11, captures this sentiment. People just had a sense that something big was coming. And now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So they are clamoring for Jesus to be close to because at any moment this thing is going to unravel and he is going to gather an army unto himself and we are going to conquer the Roman Empire and be set free from Roman oppression. Any moment this is going to happen. They thought that Jesus would overthrow the Romans and be their king, their Messiah. What they failed to understand was the nature of Jesus, who he is as the Messiah. He was not there to take over control. He's not a militant Messiah. Matthew 21, now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them both and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, here's the prophecy, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king, capital K, is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went, and they did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them and set him on them. So this is one of the 111 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, that only Jesus Christ could fulfill and will fulfill, which were written hundreds of years before he even walked the earth. It comes from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Just want you to see it yourself. It sounds very similar. Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. O shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. That is included in Matthew chapter 21. This is the line now that's not included because they don't remember the nature of the Messiah. He is just in having salvation. That shows us the nature of of him being the Messiah. It wasn't just salvation from Roman oppression, but salvation from sin, death, and hell. Lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the full of a donkey. Most of the time when a king enters the city, he does so with all of this pomp and circumstance, okay? So just imagine uh, like that, that scene in Aladdin where he's, Aladdin is approaching the palace, okay? Like that's how it was done. When a king entered the city, he would do so upon the back of the largest war horse in the land. A soldier or knight's horse would be a, a couple hands taller than the average sized horse, as he rode upon a war horse. And a horse's height is measured in hands. So you take a large man's hand and you begin stacking them like this and you go up to the top of the shoulder of the horse and that horse's height is measured in hands. A king's horse would be even taller than the other war horses in this entourage. The height of the horse was symbolic of his position and put him on an impressive pedestal as the highest man in the land. What did Jesus do? Donkeys in these ancient times were symbols of humility. Lowly and riding on a donkey. Jesus rode here not just on a donkey, but it says the colt, a full of a donkey, smaller and more lowly yet. And the mother was there probably to keep the young colt calm. And on this little donkey... It's possible even that Jesus' feet may have been dragging on the ground. It's almost a silly picture, isn't it? Some, doesn't something seem out of place? And it should seem out of place. See, it's a clue 
that things are not as they seem. Because as we've learned, if all we're looking at is the physical visible, then you miss the spiritual invisible and you will not see reality as God intends for you to see it. This was not a king who came to take and to enslave. This was a king who came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He was the life giver who was so much greater than any king that they could imagine. The best they could hope for was a king who would give them salvation from the Roman Empire. But their thinking was far too small. Jesus came to free them from the kingdom of darkness and to give victory over sin. They were looking for a temporary answer when Jesus offers us a permanent solution. God came in the flesh to solve our sin problem once and for all. No longer would there need to be enmity between God and man. God sent his son to take God's wrath for our sin, to pay the penalty of death so that we could turn to him in faith, so that he could extend to us the gift of forgiveness for our sins and give us the gift of eternal life, that promise that when we die, we would be with him forever in heaven. Jesus is the fulfillment of, of all of these many Old Testament prophecies. The question then is, are you still seeking temporary answers when Jesus is the permanent solution? Well, number four, this person of Palm Sunday, he is the King of Kings. Verse 5 in Matthew chapter 21 is actually the first time that the nation of Israel refers to Jesus as their king. Matthew 21, verse 5, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king, capital K, is coming to you. So now they are receiving, welcoming Jesus into the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem, as their king, and that's why they're throwing down their robes and waving palm branches. And in chapter 21, we pick up the story where it says, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed out crying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Now, that title, the Son of David, it connects Jesus with the covenant that God made with King David over a thousand years previous. Jesus is being presented here as the eternal king, the king who would rule forever, to whose reign there would be no end. See, the people thought that David was the greatest king there ever was and the greatest king there ever could be. But we saw last week that David fell short, didn't he? We saw last week that David kind of had a little bit of a wicked streak just like the rest of us, in his sin with Bathsheba. As, and as we looked at, at David's sin with Bathsheba, it set up this contrast between David as a king and who Jesus is as a king. So track with me what this contrast between King David and Jesus reveals about the kind of king that Jesus is. First, David saw people that he could use. David saw people that he could use. Jesus, however, wept for people with needs. Luke 19, 41 gives this account as Jesus was approaching the city of Jerusalem. As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Why weep when he's approaching all of this jubilation and celebration of himself? Would you weep over that? I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, that's better than a birthday party. He wept because he saw beyond the physical visible, and he saw the spiritual invisible reality of the true condition of their hearts and their spiritual position of condemnation before God, and that these people were the objects of God's wrath, and their time was limited and that they were confused, that they were celebrating him because they did not know who he was. And so he wept. Well, people served David, but Jesus served people. Matthew chapter 20 
It says, just as the Son of Man, this is Jesus speaking here, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, King David took life. Jesus, he gave his life and he gives life. John 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, this is Martha that he's speaking to, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? But the people who were gathered at Jerusalem that day were not wanting a king to rule over their hearts. They were wanting a king who was a military conqueror and deliverer. Someone who could deliver them from Roman rule. They had expectations of Jesus that blinded them to who he really was. See, people sometimes view Jesus just like they do an earthly king um, who wants to just take from his subjects. They expect that God just wants something from them. And Jesus shows us that as the king of kings, salvation is about what God wants for you not from you. Salvation is about what God wants for you, not from you. They didn't see their need for Jesus as their Savior because they were focused on what they wanted instead of what they needed. We don't see our spiritual need because we are focused on what we want. And when we're focused on what we want from God, we tend to relate to God on a conditional basis, as in, God, if only you would do this for me, then I'll do this for you. So it's this conditional relationship. But God does not meet us in our wants. He meets us in our time of need. In other words, if you're wanting something from God and you're making your relationship with him conditional and conditioned upon him giving you what you want, then you will hear silence from God. See, God will not respond to the arrogant, selfish conditions that we oppose upon him. No. Instead, he lovingly responds to those who submit to his conditions. Why? Because he is the king. Well, when Jesus was being who they wanted him to be, they gave him palms. When Jesus was being who they needed him to be, a savior, they gave him thorns. People sang his praises on Palm Sunday, and then they cried, crucify him, on Good Friday, all in a matter of five days. Where are you at? Are you still waiting for Jesus to measure up to your expectations? Are you still relating to God on a conditional basis, waiting for him to live up to the deal that you tried to make with him? God, if only you'll do this for me, well, then I'll give you my life. Then I'll trust you as your savior. Then I'll surrender my life to you. Then I'll relinquish my uh, control over my life and hand it over to you. Are you waiting for Jesus to measure up to your expectations? Well, number five, He's our Savior. See, Palm Sunday occurred on the 10th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. Follow this. Now, this is interesting. This is the day that the Jewish families selected the lamb that they would sacrifice for the Passover. Amazing. You know, in fact, it was divinely orchestrated that it was on this day that Jesus is presenting himself and revealing himself as the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. Matthew 21, we pick up the story of the triumphal entry. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed out cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved or stirred, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, This is Jesus. And they miss it here. The conclusion is still wrong. The prophet from Nazareth, from Nazareth of Galilee. Certainly he was a prophet, but he was so much more. Now, that word, Hosanna, why are they crying out Hosanna? That's weird. What is that all about? Many 
would uh, define this as the word praise. And if you plug praise into uh, the, the song here, that certainly makes sense. Praise to the son of, of David, praise uh, in the highest. But if you break down the word in Aramaic, it literally means save us now. This is a plea of desperation. Look in the Old Testament how this is written out. In Psalm 118, verse 25, here's a prayer of David where he says, Hosanna, and it's translated, save us now, we pray. Oh Lord, oh Lord, we pray, give us success. How many times have you prayed this? Aren't we, haven't we prayed this as a nation lately in the midst of this pandemic? Save us now, God. This is crazy. Save us from the political culture that we're in. The nation of Israel was going through upheaval at this time, too. It was not a pandemic, though. For them, it was the oppression of tyranny. We frankly don't know what that's like. Some were crying out for deliverance from Roman rule, but some, the cries of some, was much different. Some were crying out because of their recognition of their need as a sinner for a Savior to rescue them. Those are the ones that he came to save. Those were the ones whose eyes were open to see the symbol of humility in the Almighty Holy God. To be able to identify this symbol of humility in Almighty God. This is my rescuer. This is my redeemer. This is my savior from sin. So don't be like the, the crowd on Palm Sunday because when they thought that Jesus was there to fulfill their wishes, this is what they said. They took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and they cried out when they thought he was there to fulfill their wishes. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. We're all excited about God when we think he's meeting our expectations. But when they realized that Jesus was not going to do what they wanted just five days later, they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. What a heart of rejection and betrayal. They were asking five days earlier, the question in Jerusalem, who is this? But they come to the wrong conclusion. Why? Because we don't see our need when we are focused on what we want. When we are bent on getting what we want instead of what we need, we end up living a deceived life crippled by a hard heart. This is the saddest of conditions to be in. To miss who Jesus is and to live your life for what you want instead of seeking what you truly need that only Jesus can give you and to spend your life deceived and crippled by a hard heart. See, Jesus did not come as a magic genie to give us what we want. He humbled himself to give us what we need. Our greatest need, the only need that we have that transcends this life and extends into all of eternity is to be in a right relationship with God through the forgiveness of our sin that only Jesus can offer. And so in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives this invitation where he says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, all you who are crushed and overwhelmed by the weight of your guilt and sin and regret, and he says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, people who are beginning to understand who they are as sinners humbled before a holy God, and they see who Jesus is, their Savior, the only one who can take away their sins. Those people have a sense of urgency. Salvation cannot come soon enough. They cannot chase and obtain enough of Jesus soon enough. They're tired of the crushing weight of their sin, the guilt, the regret, the heartache, and they're sick of wasting their life and living without purpose. 
Has God struck you with that kind of a sense of of urgency? That as a sinner, you desperately need Jesus, and you need him now. See, you can cry out right in your heart, just like I did in the back seat of that police car. Maybe for you, your story begins today in your seat inside the auditorium of Grace Baptist Church. Maybe for you, it's, it's viewing online. That as a sinner, you desperately need Jesus, and you need him now. See, you can cry out in your heart, right in your seat right now, God, save me now. If you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do so right now. Because your eyes have been opened to see who Jesus really is. And all you have to do is turn away from your sin, forsake your sin, and turn your heart toward Jesus Christ, who alone can save. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for Palm Sunday, for the revelation of who Jesus Christ truly is. God, I thank you for offering every single person in this room the opportunity to encounter Jesus Christ, to know him as he is, a rescuer, a redeemer, the king of kings, our savior, the one who can open our eyes, the one who fulfilled prophecy, the one who answers all of the intellectual skepticism and dilemmas that we face in life and that just seem irreconcilable, uh, that uh, our circumstances that we seem to try to fix with with temporary answers. Jesus, you revealed yourself as the permanent solution to our greatest problem, our problem of sin. God, if there's anyone here this morning who says, yes, I need that Jesus. I want to know who that Jesus is. Father, in these moments, would you stir their heart to come to that place of faith, where they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I I wonder do you know him? (laughs) My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduring strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible.
thinking about memorizing that and, and doing that for you at the end, but probably wouldn't have brought the same amount of, uh, of energy and done it justice. But, you know, Pastor Jeff asked a question throughout his sermon, <clears throat> do you know who Jesus is? And just like that video asked, do you know him? Is he stirring in your heart? Have your eyes been opened? You see, God's been doing amazing things here at Grace. Uh, nearly every week since the beginning of this year, we've had someone uh, receive Christ, whether it's at the end of the sermon or sometime that week, and God's just doing amazing things, and people are taking next steps to, uh, whether it be accept Jesus as their Savior, that they want to start that relationship, they want to know Him, or it's simply, uh, I want to know Him better, I want to be in His Word every day, I want to be um, in communion and community with people who, who have this same goal, and they've been joining community groups, and God's been doing amazing things, and, and like we do every week, we want to give you an invitation to take that next step. Pastor Jeff said, if you don't know Jesus, you can know today. You can accept him as your Savior, and so if you haven't done that, if you're uncomfortable doing that, if you have more questions, please, after the service, see one of us up front here, or someone you came with that you know could help you in that direction. It, that, that is the most important question on the table today. Do you know Jesus? Do you know where you're going um, when you die? Uh, Jesus guarantees eternal life for you. And then secondly, maybe you believe in Jesus, uh, but you've been hesitant. You've been seeking, you know, what, G what you want from Jesus rather than what you need from Jesus in your walk with him. You, whether it's circumstances of the day and age right now or this past week, this is what I want, God. Why aren't you giving it to me and you need to surrender. You need to submit to him and say, God, what, what do I need from you? And it made me think of, you know, right after Jesus shared who he was when they're asking, who, who are you? And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm the king, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. And they're like, that's, that's not my king. My king's going to fix everything the way I want. Th this is what some people concluded. This is in John chapter 12. This is what people did believe. It says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They were unwilling to go all in. They were unwilling to take the next step, and therefore forfeited the glory of God for the glory of man. And I hope, it's my prayer as a pastor, that, that that's nobody here today. That as you're realizing the next step you need to take in your walk with the Lord, you take it. So that you individually and we collectively as a church never miss out on the glory of God and what He can do through us. In this community, in our families, in our friendships, in our circles, in this world. And so if you're here online and you're watching today... Reach out in the comments, private message us, any way you can get a hold of us through the app. There's a multitude of ways. Please reach out. We would love to help you take your next step. And then if you're here in person as well, the invitation is here every week. We can pray with you. We can meet with you. Um, never pass up the opportunity to take the next step and see God do something amazing as he has been doing here since the beginning of 2021 at Grace. So um, I'm going to close us in prayer, and then afterwards we'll be dismissed. But please... Do not brush it off. Find a way to take your next step. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are, um, that you are the King of kings. God, that you loved us so much. You sent your son to die for us. And God, um, I know through my life, I have so many expectations and so many desires for what my relationship with you will bring in my life. 
And God, you just keep correcting it. You keep chiseling away at my desire for, for man's glory rather than your glory. My desire for self-glory rather than your glory. And God, I pray you never stop. I pray you never stop humbling me by looking to the cross and my Savior and what he's done for me and how it started as we'll celebrate this this week, the death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus. It started riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey. Everything Jesus was was gentle and lowly and humble and desiring to serve others. And God, my heart is so far from that. I pray you'd keep changing me. I pray you'd keep changing the culture here at Grace Baptist to be people who are passionate about making more and better followers of you. And they're doing that through ultimate sacrifice, ultimate service, being the hands and feet of Jesus to others who desperately need him. So we thank you for the time in your word today. We thank you for Pastor Jeff and just your, your blessing on him and, and preaching the word today. We pray that there would be nobody here, whether online or in person, who, who misses the next step. God, that they desire to see your glory done in their life and through this church. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your week. Thank you.